Hello, everybody. All right, it is time to begin. And it's it's a little odd for me to be doing this virtual as opposed to in person. I love to kind of be hands on and be able to see everybody and, and chat with everybody before and after. But this is really the next best thing. And I want to welcome you all. My name is Ruth Rumack. I am the Executive Director of Education at Ruth Rumack's Learning Space. And uh, tonight we're going to talk about executive functions and understanding them and why they are important and how we can support our kids to develop strong skills as well as give them the independence eventually and allow them to take on those skills for themselves. So let's see, without further ado, I'm going to press my button. As some of you know that I am not 100% technically savvy, but I'm doing my best. All right, I'm moving along. I'm trying to move my screen. Here we go. People could be laughing at me. That's okay. All right, that's me. My hair was longer. Uh, I want to tell you a little bit about myself. I, I do have my honors BA in psychology and my bachelor's of education. And way, way, way back in 1996, I established Ruth Rumax Learning Space. Uh, it was originally, you know, me and kids in my living room and we would work together on the work that they would bring. But as I started to see more students, I started to see more patterns developing and patterns of, um, misunderstanding or things that weren't just clicking for the kids in the classroom. And when I would find a student that had a challenge or they would find me, um, my main goal was to research and to figure out what is it that they need? Why aren't they getting this concept in the way that it's being presented? And over a number of years, you know, I, I honed many different skills and worked on different programs and learned about many different programs and brain plasticity, which is one of my favorite things to talk about. And I I developed a whole set of, um, of ways of working with students and giving them what they needed in the best way possible. And that's when Ruth Rumax Learning Space was born. It started in my living room, one student at a time, and now we have two fabulous locations in Toronto. But even better than that, now we are global because everything that we're doing is online. And I'm really excited to say that what we've done, taken our, our approach, which is a direct instruction pedagogy, which means that we're teaching those concepts very clearly step by step, and we are working towards mastery. We use a lot of one-to-one um, uh, -one instruction as well as we do group classes. And all of our teachers are Ontario certified teachers. So we went from living room, one-on-one, -on -one, me and my students having tea and having a great time to two locations, over 30 full-time staff members and a whole bunch of incredible educators um, and a support team that really work with each family in order to figure out what it is that that student needs. We meet that student where they are right now and then we put a program together that will support them for their immediate goals as well as their long-term goals. And we like to be active, we like to be, we like to have fun, you'll hear giggles and chuckles and, and you know, we're just, we're having a great time while we're learning. And that I think is one of the most important things is to make it an, a safe environment and a, a really enjoyable environment. All right, let us move on. Let's see, hopefully I can get the next slide to come up. Give me a moment here. Oh, where is it in my little, no, doesn't want to do it. Oh, there it goes. Super. Um, so let's talk about executive functions. Well, I've heard this analogy before, that executive functions are like the conductor of an orchestra. And the conductor of the orchestra has many, many instruments in which to, um, to, to conduct and to figure out what they're doing next. But it's that conductor's job to get everybody together all at the same time and move forward in sync. So our executive functions are like that. Our executive functions is that base, that sort of web underneath that allows us to plan something, initiate that plan, work through the plan, stay on task, and then of course complete the plan, and then reflect back and figure out what worked and what didn't work. So all of those things combined, that's a lot of skills. There are a lot of things that we need to be able to do in order to get from planning stage through to execution, through to completion, through to reflection. So I like to break them down in terms of thinking, 
versus doing executive functions. And this might help you understand how many pieces are really involved in this puzzle of initiating and getting through a task. So if we look on the thinking side, we have our working memory. Uh, that's how well we can keep information at hand quick enough or, or at our fingertips in order to use it right away. We've got planning and prioritization. So looking ahead, as well as figuring out what we need to do first. Organization, it's a big topic. Time management, staying on task with that time frame. The metacognition, that's the reflection or the thinking about our thinking. And sequencing thoughts and information, which means in the right order so that we can get it done efficiently. So those are all the thinking pieces that we need. We also have the other side of things, which are the doing things, the doing part, which would be our response inhibition. So keeping those other ideas out of our brain so that we don't just blurt something out. Um, it's also keeping emotional control and keeping our focus and our attention. And just getting started is part of our executive functions, that kind of get up and go, that kick from behind that allows us to get into whatever task we need to do. Goal-directed persistence and flexibility, those are keeping our eye on the prize, but also being able to switch gears if we need to or pivot, as many of us have done over the last eight months. Um, and then last, we've got sequencing multi-step tasks. So it's the, uh, the ability to take something that's many, many steps and then figure out what to do first in order to be efficient and to reach your goal. All right, I'm, I'm going to say also, I did just jump into it, but a few things. We are recording this, and at the end uh, of tonight, you will be receiving an email from us that has a few things, um, some feedback requests. Hopefully, you can let us know how we did, but also um, some handouts and things that will be pertinent to what we're discussing tonight. And we will be sharing the recording with you um, in the next day or so. We're, we'll clean it up and we'll send it out so that you can watch it again or share it with somebody else. We also have the opportunity, if you do have questions, and I know that a lot of you sent your questions in earlier, which I really appreciate, and I'm, I'm hoping that I'm touching on the things that you're looking for in this seminar. Um, but if you do have questions as we go along, feel free to put something into the chat box. I think the chat box will be the best place to do it. And uh, we'll try and respond to those as, as we go along. In any event, I will definitely be available for questions at the end. Okay, let's see if I can get this to move forward again. Yay, all right. So let's talk about weak executive functions. And I think that's probably why, why a lot of us are here, which is to understand when those executive functions are not working at their optimal, what do we do? But first we have to talk about what do they look like? And you know, in our learning practice, in our learning space, we see a lot of students with multiple challenges. Um, they may have a, a learning difference. They may have ADHD. They may uh, also carry a lot of anxiety with them. And dysgraphia, that's the inability to form letters um, clearly among other things. These are all things that work together to make executive functions difficult and a challenge. And what would it look like? A lot of you probably know this, this picture of keeping track of your stuff. So, you know, kids who have really messy backpacks, they can't find anything. They put something down like a jacket, for example, in the middle of the winter, and they don't come back with a jacket on at the end of the day. And you might think, how did you, how did you actually get back in into the house or leave the school without a jacket on? Don't you recognize that you're cold? But when you have weak executive functions, among other things, you may just not recognize it or realize it and then end up empty handed. Um, another part of this might look like getting down to work. So kids with weak executive functions may take a long time to get settled. They may not know where to find their books. They may have put something in their bag, but now they can't find it. They may not know what the homework is because they didn't write it down. Uh, it, it also comes out in just being able to sit in one place and stay focused on that task for long enough to get through to the end of it. Planning a project is really difficult for kids with weak executive functions. And I know I had a bunch of questions about that and we'll be addressing that later on this evening. Um, it, it's that moment of 
I know I have lots to do. I know that I have an assignment coming up, but I have no idea how to get started. Um, and that's where you'll see it, where you know, you'll, you'll get kind of that hair pulling moment where you realize you've got something due tomorrow, but that child hasn't started it the night before. So planning, managing time, understanding what the priority is and how to focus is something that you might be familiar with forgetting or losing homework, um, and then just maintaining consistent routines. And I have to say that, you know, as parents, and I'm a parent, I've got two kids, my daughter is in grade six, she's 11, and I have a big, big kid, he is 28. Um, but we've been through it all at all stages and at various times over the last many years. Um, what we see, you know, is executive functions will develop. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about that too. So we understand what it looks like. It, it also, it's not just about the stuff. It's not just about taking care of your stuff or organizing your things that are tangible. It has a lot of, of um, pieces to do with retrieving information and keeping things in sequence and scope. So when a child, you might think it's more on the, um, you know, the time management side that the reason that's the reason they can't get their work done because they're not focused or they're not paying attention or they're not bringing the right stuff home. But it actually has a lot to do with the deeper brain processes of processing information and understanding the sequence of information. So that would be really difficult to write an essay if you're having trouble manipulating or kind of holding on to the ideas in your head um, and you need a strategy in order to capture those ideas and then get them out, reorganize them, and then work through each part on its own. Okay, another big part of weak executive functions is your controlling of the your emotions and your responses. So response inhibition and emotional control. And that may look like meltdowns. That might look like shouting, screaming, crying, hiding, running and hiding under a desk or locking yourself in the bathroom because you're very upset. It's, an, it's a heightened emotional outpouring um, in a moment where, you know, you may look at your, your child and think, I don't know, you know, this is really upsetting for them, but I don't know what is so upsetting or the smallest thing might tip them off and might create that emotional overload for them. So let's keep moving. Uh, I'm going to try and get the next slide. I, you know, it's just it's tricky for me to get to the next slide. Okay. So here's a picture of the brain. And that green part represents the frontal lobe. And the frontal lobe is where you are, you know, your motor functions, your problem solving, your spontaneity, your memory, language, initiation, and all of your executive functions live in the frontal lobe. And the one thing, if you remember one thing from tonight, I hope that you take away that your frontal lobe is the last part of the brain to develop. And it is not fully developed until age 25. And for some of our, our ADHD students, their maturity is sometimes a few years behind, which means that it may take even longer than age 25 for that frontal lobe and all those executive functions to fully develop. And I know what you're thinking, you're going, oh my God, no, how am I going to get through that? But the truth is, and what we're going to talk about tonight is that they will develop, they develop over time. And if you can be consistent and, you know, help your students, or perhaps you're, you're finding this out for yourself because you have weak executive functions yourself. They are a skill, they are skills, a set of skills that can be taught and can be learned. And that is the best part of all of this, is that even for someone with extremely weak executive functions, with time, time and practice and consistency, they can develop those skills and you can develop those skills and your kids can develop those skills. So we're going to keep that hopeful tone and move on to the next slide. All right. I think I'm getting hang of it. I think that the thing tonight is I'm using a Mac and I don't usually use a Mac, but why not? Okay. So Let's talk a little bit. Oh, I think I'm going to go back because something looks like it's out of order. There we go. Let's talk a little bit about 
the ages and stages. And we want to talk about developmental stages and what those signs of weak executive function might look like at different stages. Each of you in, in our audience tonight uh, may have kids at various levels and with various needs and challenges. So we'll go through the whole gamut from preschool up to adulthood and then you'll see sort of what it should look like and what it might look like if there is a challenge. So in preschool, we would generally expect that our preschool kids would be able to put their toys back uh, where they belong. They would be able to understand instructions and recall instructions. So if I tell my, my three or four year old something, especially something that is about safety, like don't touch the stove, it's hot, they should be able to remember that. It might take a try or two, but over a short period of time, they should be able to understand and recall that instruction. Um, it's also at that stage, the ability to play with a partner and to interact socially with that partner. If a preschooler has challenges with weak executive function, then it might look like a lot of difficulty following instructions. So what may you may think, think is not listening or not uh, paying attention may actually be a sign of weak executive functioning. If they look like they're paying attention, but when you watch them follow through on the task that you've asked them to do, it is clear that they are not, they're not following what you asked them to do. A preschooler with weak executive functions may be easily frustrated. They're, they might throw things, have tantrums. They may act out aggressively because of that challenge with um, controlling emotions and response inhibition. Now, what I'm describing is also quite typical of most preschoolers at some point in the day or the week. But when we, when we notice that this is pervasive, that this is all the time, um, and that even the smallest things will set them off, then we might want to look at executive functions or the things that um, show up as challenges with executive functions. All right, I'm going to move on to kindergarten. And so kindergarten to grade two, so that's the ages of, let's say, five or six all the way to seven or eight. Um, they should be able to follow two or three step tasks, which would look like, uh, okay, get your, get your books from your desk and come and meet me on the carpet. Or I need you to pack your lunch and your hat and meet me at the front door. So those are longer, you know, two or three steps. They should be able to follow those. Uh, a child of that age should be able to clean their room independently to some degree. I know, again, you're thinking, oh my God, I wish my seven-year-old would clean their room. But uh, the truth is that they have the capability of organizing their own things, um, you know, even just a, a particular area, setting the table. They should be able to um, keep track of things that go into their bag and things that come out of their bag. And of course, socially being able to play with kids independently and have their own independent conversations. So challenges would look like putting your hand up. You really want to answer something. You're really excited about it. And then the teacher calls on you and you forget. You don't, you don't know what you needed to say next. Um, it might also look like being in a conversation, but not following the through line of the conversation. And then when it's your turn to talk or you want to add something to the conversation, it's quite off topic. Um, that emotional control, tantrums over minor things, maybe even a panic when the routine changes, if, if that set schedule isn't followed exactly. Uh, the, that lack of, lack of flexibility we might see in a kindergarten to grade two student who's having trouble with their executive functions. All right, let's move on. I'm going to save questions for later at, at the end of this section for, um, for the developmental stages because I want to definitely get to the tips and tricks. So if we're looking at grades three to five, uh, we're looking at kids who are about eight through to 10 or 11. They should be able to, for example, read and follow the through line, the plot of a chapter book. Um, and that's where you really see that working memory at work because you have to remember the characters and the plot and what just happened. Let's say you put your book down for a few minutes and then you pick it up again. If your child is having difficulty remembering where they are in the story or what came before it, we wanna question that a little bit further. Um, you might also want to make sure that your child is working on longer projects and that they're able to sustain their attention throughout that time period. And uh, in terms of the social side of things, you know, sharing secrets and jokes with friends and, and keeping that social interaction strong. 
Challenges in this area would look like starting a task, not finishing it. So, you know, doing a few questions or half a question in math and then moving on and doing something for their English homework and then moving on or only starting part of something and then forgetting about it completely. Um, forgetting things at school is a big one that we see. You know, our students will often come to us with their, uh, you know, half of their homework, but they don't have the assignment sheet or they may have brought the assignment sheet, but they don't actually have the book that they need to refer back to. You might see that backpack, which is really exploding and they can't find anything at all within that backpack. Um, Let's talk about a little bit older. So now we're into middle school, grade six to eight. And a grade six to eight student should be able to perform a multi-step math problem, for example, with, without losing their place. Um, you know, we're not talking about the skill of math, but we're talking about being able to follow the process. It might also be like following the process of long division, for example. There are many steps involved. And when we have students that have weak executive functions, following any type of process or um, set of instructions from beginning to end can be challenging. So we would ex expect a grade six to eight student to be able to keep track of their own homework for the most part, at least to know where to find that information and to start thinking more logically in terms of the big picture of things. Um, so what does it look like when a child has a weakness? Definitely a hard time starting big assignments, especially if it has a long time frame. that's really challenging because they just don't know where to begin. And if they begin in one, at one point in one day, they may not come back to that same thing the next time they go to work on that project. It's very scattered and all over the place. Um, on the emotional side, you know, a, a child who is blaming others, not taking responsibility for their own actions, that's part of the emotional control that may be a challenge as part of the executive functions too. All right, let's see if we can move on. As we get a little bit older, oh, I think I missed one. No, I didn't. Uh, so now we're into high school, grades nine to 12. And at this point, you really are expecting your child to be able to take care of their own homework plans, know when their tests are, be prepared for class, uh, do their homework somewhat independently, mostly independently, and that they have a good understanding of how to manage their own time, as well as reflect on how they're doing. They should be able to, to, to say, well, I, I did really well on this part of the essay. Next time, I'm going to have to add more quotations. So they're doing that reflection or the metacognition part. Somebody with weak executive functions is going to have a difficult time, again, keeping track of their assignments and staying on task with their assignments, knowing when tests are. You may have experienced this at home where a child will come home in tears or call you in tears to say, I just walked into math class and there was a quiz and I had no idea that there was a quiz. So those are little signs that something is missing in terms of their being able to uh, keep track of what is what, what they're responsible for and what's being asked of them. Another little sign is not being able to finish a, uh, um, a not being able to finish a test or um, a, a, a timed assignment in the allotted time. And that is something that could have to do with ADHD and focus and attention. It could have something to do with um, just being able to, the processing speed of somebody's, the way that their brain is processing the information. Um, but often when you have weak executive functions, you get stuck in a place. And when you get stuck in a place, you either will not finish that task before you move on, or you start to, um, you know, sort of almost spiral out in that moment, and then you lose your focus and it's difficult to carry on. Uh, so, that type of thing, as well as the Im impulsivity and perhaps engaging in risky behavior is another sign of weak executive functions. Again, that emotional control and, and response inhibition. So let's take a look at the very last one in this section, which is 18 plus. So now, now you're an adult. And when you are an adult with weak executive functions, that, you know, I'm going to jump to the, the part that is challenging, it is going to be challenging 
to keep track of your things, to know when you're expected to be somewhere. When you're in the workforce, it becomes a challenge to make sure that you are hitting the targets that your boss has set for you. Or if you're an entrepreneur working on your own, it might be difficult to initiate your tasks to get your own things done. Um, and then of course, we've got the emotional component of things, which again, that, that weak, um, weaker ability to control the emotions and somebody who is just really getting upset very quickly um, often. So these are things that we, we want to look for. But as I said, executive functions can be improved and they are a skill. And because we know about brain plasticity and we know that the brain will continue to grow and the more we practice something, the more we master it, the easier it will get the deeper the groove in the brain will become and it will be faster for our, our brains to recognize what we need to do next. It is possible to make improvements in all of these areas. Not, uh, it's not impossible. Um, and I want to leave you with the hope that this is, this is something that we can do. All right, I'm going to try, let's, let's see if anybody's got any questions so far in terms of the developmental stages um, you can put them in the chat box. Hopefully the chat box will pop up for me. And um, if anybody's got any questions. Ruth, there is a question. Let's hear it. So a question is, you speak about ADHD, but could the same be said about autistic students? Yes, definitely. I think uh, individuals who are on the spectrum are also have difficulty with the executive functions. And there's a lot of crossover between, you know, if you, if we were going to do a diagram of a whole bunch of different challenges, let's say ADHD, learning challenges or learning differences, um, individuals on the autism spectrum, it's like a Venn diagram. And there are many parts that are, that overlap and that crossover. And so the students that we see that are um, on the spectrum, they have a significant challenge with that idea of starting something, um, you know, creating a clear path to follow and following through with it. So I would say, yes, I, I mean, it, there is so much crossover and it's really difficult sometimes to tease out or how or to appropriate, you know, well, this challenge is because of that diagnosis. It doesn't really matter because the student is, is suffering in many ways because of it. It doesn't matter what you attribute it to. Um, but if we know that it's an issue, that those weak executive functions are an issue, then we can target them and we can work through them uh, both on an academic side and an emotional and inhibition regulation side. Any other questions? There's another question. If we work with the child from grades three to four, can they still have those issues mentioned when they reach grade six or above? Absolutely. And this is the thing that I think is really challenging for a parent because you, you know, you, you recognize these things early, you recognize that they're a challenge and that they are um, getting in the way of your child's success in some situations. And lots of parents are, you know, they're on top of it and they're helping to manage their kids. They, they are being their frontal lobe and they are taking care of the scheduling and the time management and the prioritizing and the scope and the sequence of things. And a lot of parents say to me, oh my gosh, like my kid is in grade five and I'm still doing this and I don't know, like, am I going to have to do this for the rest of their lives? And as, as much as it seems like that now at these early stages, there is a natural progression and that they will gain these skills. But as I said, it takes lots of patience, lots of practice and mastery of that skill and lots of repetition over a period of time. And in, the, in a slide in a little while, we're going to see that there's sort of some plateaus that we reach and then we have to kind of gather our troops again and then we get to that next stage of success. So even when your child is in grade three, three and four and you're setting these great examples and you're modeling good things, um, you will have to continue to model those things and monitor them and practice them. But one of the terms that I like to use is a gradual release of responsibility. And that as your child gets older, of course, they're going to want more independence and a parent's gonna say, but I can't give you more independence because I can't trust that you're gonna do it. I, that's what we're saying in our heads. Um, but we have to kind of, it's like one step forward, two steps back, one step forward, two steps back sometimes. So 
to answer your question, yes, you're going to have to do it grade three and four. You're probably going to have to, to be there in some capacity, grade five and six, and maybe beyond. Because remember that this frontal lobe doesn't really give you um, the, the full maturation until much, much later at, at age 25. So does that mean that we're going to have to be, you know, doing our 25 year old schedule for them? Probably not. Um, but if we start with skills early and we start practicing early, like grade three and four, you're going to see progression between three and four and five and six, they're going to gain more skills and seven and eight, they're going to gain more skills. And eventually you will be able to step back as well. Any other questions? There's one more. It says, what if the autistic child has more than a few challenges in different age groups? Meaning over a period of different ages, the challenges are going to change. And you know what you are dealing with at, at age five and six for a, a child who is on the autism spectrum will be very different than what you're dealing with at age 10 and 12 or age 15 and 16. Um, I can speak from my own family experience. You know, one of my nephews is on the, the spectrum, on the Asperger's side of, of the spectrum. Um, and what, you know, what his parents were dealing with at age three and four was one thing. And they kind of worked on that and got a lot of support around one area and that was strengthened and then moved on to the next thing. And sometimes you have to pick and choose. You have to pick your battles because you don't want to um, you don't you don't want to overload the support and, and sort of water it down. You want to make sure that you have sort of clearly identified what are the short-term goals. This is what we do at Ruth Through Max Learning Space is we identify what are the short-term goals? What do we work on right now in order to make that child uh, successful in this particular area? And what are the next step goals? And when we've reached our immediate goals, we move on to the list and, and get to the next thing. So it will change and you can't, you certainly can't address everything at once. And I would say that goes for all students. So you wanna choose the thing that you think is the most important and then focus on that for a little while until you've established a routine there. Okay, uh, I just, move. sorry, I just wanna add that uh, the person that asked that question, she says grade 11 is still dealing with grade five to six, grade seven to eight problems. Yes, yes, and and you will see that. And you know, for for that person who's made the, that question, stick around at the end. We can continue to have the conversation. But especially with, with an individual on the spectrum, you know, the skills are going to develop at, at a different rate than sort of than, than neurotypical. And one of the things that we have to sort of, as I said, focus on is what is the most immediate thing for right now. The other things may be put on the back burner and they, the, these pieces will come together, but it, it's not going to be a long, it's not going to be a, a quick fix. It's a long, long process that we need to have patience with and watch the progress as we go along. But for that particular viewer, I would be happy to have a full on conversation at the end. I'm going to move on so we don't run out of time. I don't even know what time it is. I'm going to have to check. Okay. So this is um, why the developmental stages are so important because we know that that there's going to be a great improvement between ages eight to 10 generally, and then they're going to plateau from 10 to 12 or so where they're kind of, they're going to get into the, you know, it's going to seem as though things are not moving forward, but then they're going to have another bump up by middle school and they're going to start to develop these ideas and the, the skills for independent learning. But middle school, even by the end of high school, well, let's not say by the end of middle school, as they're transitioning to high school, they are far from developed. And this is where we have to keep that in mind that, you know, we still need to, as parents, be monitoring in some way where our kids are, especially for those kids who have challenges with their executive functions, and that they are using the tools that have been provided for them, and that they're figuring out what tools work best for them. So let's talk a little bit more about tools. And, okay, so when we start and we are starting to work on these executive functioning skills, we really need to be explicit. We need to share instructions very clearly because remember that 
listening and following instructions is challenging for somebody with weak executive skills. So our explanations, our, our models, our uh, visual demonstrations need to be very, very clear and very targeted. So when you're starting out, we want to talk about something simple, like let's say just picking up your toys at the end of the day. You know, if I said to um, an eight-year-old with executive functioning challenges, go and clean your room and you send them to their room and you think, okay, in 10 minutes, I should go back in there and all the pieces should be put away and everything should be fine. And I go back in there 10 minutes later and it may even look worse than it did before. Uh, maybe you've been in that situation where you've seen the Lego on the floor, you come back, there's even more Lego on the floor or the clothes are out of the hamper or the cupboard doors are swung open and everything is toppled out. What we need to do in those situations is be extremely specific and teach the steps one step at a time. We like to use lots of visual um, models or visual explanations. You might have a picture of what something looks like before and after so that they know what they're working towards. So for example, and you'll see some pictures of this later, um, you know, if it's a problem with Lego, we need a bin that has a picture of Lego on it or the word Lego on it. And that is where all the Lego lives so that the child knows very explicitly and you do this with them several times, um, you do it together, then maybe you stay, take a little step back and then you watch them do it and you supervise them doing it. And then eventually you're gonna be able to, to lead them towards independence. But at that beginning stage, whatever it is, whether it's a younger child cleaning their room or an older child cleaning their room, uh, or you're talking about even putting something together for essay writing, you're gonna start it step-by-step step from the beginning. You're gonna to move to that middle stage, which is the guided practice and feedback. So you're gonna show them what they're doing. They're gonna show you what they're doing. And then you're gonna give them some feedback and then let them try it again on their own. And eventually what we're moving towards is independence. And this is what I was talking about earlier as the, the um, gradual release of responsibility. So it's gradual, it doesn't happen overnight. It's not as though you say, well, I gave you a picture of what it looks like and you know, you tried it and you didn't, you didn't do it. You're gonna have to go back to the beginning, show them again, step by step, and then slowly but surely remove the support over time. I think that's one of the biggest frustrations for parents and, and one of the biggest mistakes also is that they remove the support too early. And sometimes you get kickback from a child, you know, you've put something in place, whether it's about their agenda or, you know, it's a homework system or it's a getting out the door first thing in the morning system and the child really doesn't want to adhere to it. But Part of our job as parents is to stay the course through that hot air that is blown in your direction, knowing that we're going to try this, we're going to keep our patience, we're not going to overreact, we're going to keep our emotional control under control, we're going to keep ourselves in a calm place so that we can support that student in the best way that we can. All right, we're going to talk more specifically um, in a moment, so let's... Let's look at what's next. So next I have a whole bunch of um, actual challenges and some ways of how to help. And a lot of you, I'm just looking at my list of questions from, um, from before people have sent in their questions. And a lot of people have asked about how do I help my child keep track of their things? How do I help them um, you know, avoid meltdowns at homework time? How do I help them get a, a, a teenager organized so that they feel more independent? So hopefully some of these things will, will, will be helpful to you. Even if the example is for a younger child or an older child, that's not the, the age of the child you're thinking of, um, they can be extended or changed in order to make it more appropriate for that particular age group. So here's a common challenge, and we see this at the learning space all the time. Items are left at home or they're left at school and you can't find your stuff when you need it. And it's usually at the 11th hour when you know it's like just before going to bed and the child remembers that they needed to bring something home to sign or whatever. So here are some quickies on, on how to help. First of all, check lists. We've got one word for you, although it's two syllables, checklists. The checklists are so important. And 
as adults, we use checklists all the time. You know, we have our to-do list and we carry that through with us through the day and then to the next day and the week, et cetera. And for kids, checklists are just as important and maybe even more important. So for a younger student, you can see our example on the screen. You can uh, make it visual. So you might have a checkbox where they get to check something off. You might have a picture of what it is that they need if they don't wanna read the whole thing, they just have a visual reminder. And this is an end of day checklist. So these are the things that a child should remember to bring home at the end of the day. Of course, it's personalized. And if you can get your child involved in creating that checklist and bringing their own icons and their own pictures or drawing their own pictures, it will personalize it for them. Um, this is something that you can have uh, in, the, in, the, in a notebook so that you know, they're looking at their notebook if they remember to look in their notebook. It's something that you might have posted in a locker, or I've got an example here. Um, we make up little cards. These are definitely for younger students, but you could think of how to adapt it for an older student. We make up cards. They are on, I don't know if you can see this, they're on um, like a keychain ring. We just laminated them and put a hole punch through them. So they're all on one keychain. And then we attach this to the strap of the backpack so that it's right there hanging off the backpack. Or if a child doesn't want it to be seen, it can go inside the backpack. But it's a visual and a tactile reminder of what to bring home. So please bring your lunch home with you, your lunch box. Please bring your shoes home with you. Please bring your, what else have we got on here? Your laptop, etc. So again, it can be personalized um, to what that child needs to bring or what they seem to forget most. If because we're in the age of, of technology, you know, setting reminders and notifications on your personal devices are really helpful. And that's what we do with most of our middle school and up kids that have their own phone. We will help them to set a reminder, an alarm, um, a special sound that reminds them, it, you know, it's sort of a memory link to a, a particular item or something that they need to do at that time. All right, let's look at the next thing. Those visual reminders are just so crazy important. And even in my house, you know, I have a list at the front door. So if, if I, let's say we're leaving for a vacation, one day we'll be leaving for a vacation again. Uh, and I want to make sure that I remember all these very important things. I actually post the list at the front door so that I'm checking it off before I leave. Um, the, okay, let's talk about the next one, working memory. So working memory is the ability to keep all the information that you need for a task at hand when you need it. I like to think of it as juggling. And when you're juggling more than one ball, you're throwing all the balls up in the air, your working memory is the ability to remember that that ball is up in the air and it's about to come down. You have to be prepared and ready to catch that ball as it comes flying through the air. So one of the things that is a challenge is remembering what is for homework, especially if a teacher has said it very quickly at the end of the day and the student hasn't written it down in their agenda. So you get home, you've had a snack, maybe watch television, whatever you're doing, and you sit down to do the homework and it's a blank, like it's a complete blank. They have no idea what they're doing. And they, the student and or the parent have to kind of be detectives and work backwards to figure out where you might get this information. Now, if you're lucky and your school uses a portal like Blackboard or Google or a Google Classroom, or there are a number of them, first of all, I would say as a parent, it is essential to be familiar with that portal and know where to find the day's agenda, know where to find the homework for each class, and hopefully the teachers are posting on it so that you can find what you need. But take the time to get familiar with it. I know at first it's, it can be really overwhelming, especially if you have a child with a lot of different classes or a lot of different teachers, but just take the time to take a tour and get familiar with it so you can find what you're looking for so that you can help them find what they're looking for. Okay, some in-school things. 
take a photo of the board. Most classrooms will allow uh, devices for this purpose. So if your school or your classroom that your child's class doesn't allow phones during class, you can, especially if your child has a particular challenge with working memory or with executive functions or an LD or any number of things, you can make an arrangement with the classroom teacher that they take a photo of the board before it's erased or before the end of the day. That photo can be invaluable because you can then team that up with something uh, assistive technology wise like Google Keep or some other um, you know, OneNote or Evernote so that you've got all the information filed electronically in one area. And we'll talk a little bit more about those organizational systems later on. Setting up a buddy system. It's always a good idea. Have somebody in the class that your child can connect with in order to you know, re be refreshed of, about what's due. Um, and then we've got lots, there are lots of different apps and extensions that you can use to, again, you know, set reminders or make lists and things like that. So many of you uh, may be familiar with Google Keep, and I'm going to tell you a little bit more about it, but it's basically almost like a catch-all where you can upload pictures, you can put your notes in there, you can annotate things, you can put lists and, and reminders, but it's all filed under one I would say divider, like imagine you've got a binder and it's its own divider. You can really shape your Google Keep to whatever, it, however it works best for you. Okay, let's see what else we've got. So. Sorry, Ruth, there is a question here. Oh, goody, I love questions, <laughs> go ahead. Uh, how do you get your team to focus on executive functions and brackets, planning, time management, assignments, et cetera, when they have a gaming addiction? Oh, this is, this is a tough one. This is really tough because a gaming addiction, and, and we know that it is an addiction at this point, you know, addiction, um, and I'm not an expert on addiction at all, but, you know, from my reading and my research, I understand that it, the, the part of the brain, you know, the, uh, the dopamine, the, the happy feeling is, is something that is being pumped into the brain and that, you know, your cortisol level rises and you've got all sorts of other brain chemicals that are giving you this rush. And the, the gaming part of it keeps you there and it keeps you focused because you're constantly getting this rushed feeling and, and that's exciting and exhilarating. And it's hard to pull a teen away from that because when they go back to normal life, you're not getting that kind of adrenaline boost all the time. So, it's a tough one. I mean, I would say if there is a true addiction there, I hope that you are working with some kind of, um, of a counselor or support system to, to be working on, um, you know, maybe cognitive behavioral therapy or some type of, of therapy to work on getting away from the computer. Um, but one of the things, I mean, it's a tough one. But again, it's about, I think, the consistency and setting out the, the um, setting out the expectations. So, you know, if you have school at one period of time, and then there's a period of time where you can, you can be on the computer if that's something that is, is allowable, but there has to be a carved out time and probably the same time every day. And I would say if you are able to, you know, get the child home from school or, or end of school, whether they're working from home right now or not, that's when you do your prioritizing, you have a snack, you kind of get some fresh air, and then you work in that time frame before the gaming. I think it, it's really important that the, the prioritizing and the um, understanding of, of the schedule and knowing what that child has to do, what their um, responsibilities are gonna be for that day has to happen before the gaming begins because once they're on, it's very difficult to pull them back off. Um, again, if you're looking for some specific strategies, stay on the call afterwards and we can chat a little bit longer. Uh, let's talk Sorry. about planning. One oh, more yeah. question. Uh, yeah. Can these tools like Google Keep act as a crutch for the child? Oh, as in the crutch, in that the crutch becomes debilitating, like they, that they're not ever going to learn the skills on their own? Um, if that's what you mean. Um, I don't think it's a crutch. I think it's a tool. I think that 
when you have a system that works for you and the system is efficient and you are actually you become more efficient and more on top of your work because of it then it's not a crutch it's it's um it's an item that helps you move forward so if a child is over reliant on their calendar or over reliant on google keep i would say that's actually a good thing because they are learning that there is a way to manage their um information and they don't have to rely on their own memory or their own, you know, because it, it's inconsistent. And as a, an individual with weak executive functions, they need those tools and they need that backup because their, their memory isn't there for them at the time that they need it all the time. So if they've found a system that works and it's effective and they're actually successful because of it, I don't think it's a crutch. I use an agenda all the time. If I don't write something down, I don't remember it. If, if I move my information to Google Keep, for example, at least I know where it is and I can find it when I need it, as opposed to having to run around the house or, you know, have a meltdown because I haven't brought the right piece of paper home. So I would say if it, it, it becomes a crutch only when that child says, I don't have to do the work because it's on my Google, you know, the information's on my Google Keep. That's, I think, when it becomes a crutch, if they're choosing not to follow through with their responsibilities. But if it's just as a landing place to keep everything together, I would go for it. It's going to make your life a lot easier um, as a parent, but it's going to make their lives a lot easier and less stressful too. Okay, I'm going to move on. Let's talk about about uh, planning and prioritizing, because this is a big deal. You know, you've got a big project. You've got a project that is going, you know, that's a due date that's three weeks in advance. And for a lot of individuals, three weeks, oh my gosh, three weeks, I've got ages of time. I don't even have to start this. I don't have to think about it. I don't have to even look at it for another two and a half weeks. But if we want to model good skills and we want to practice good skills, we want to work with that student. And this is something we do with our students one on one and in our group classes all the time is we plan backwards. We do something called a backwards plan. So we look at the due date and we look at all the little tasks, all the pieces of the puzzle that we need to complete. We write them all down. One thing I would recommend, you know, some assignment sheets are better than others. And some teachers are really good at being very clear and specific in terms of what is due and when it's due. They might even break that work down for the, the students and give them mini due dates before the final due date. But as you get older and into high school and some teachers just don't do that, they just say, here's your assignment sheet. It's due in three weeks, hand it in on the due date. Well, in those situations, we really need to look at that assignment sheet clearly. A lot of students do not read the assignment sheets. And when they sit down to do their work, they think that they know what they're supposed to do, but in fact, they aren't on track. They are doing something different. Or maybe they heard the teacher say something, so they're focusing on that aspect, but that's really one small piece of the, the, the puzzle where there's a bigger piece that they still need to complete. So as soon as you get an assignment sheet, sit down with your kids and read it with them. Read it out loud. If they don't want to do their reading, you do the reading out loud. Uh, it's better if they read it out loud and then you stop them at the end of each part to say, oh, okay, so the first thing that it sounds like we need to do is this. So let's write that part down. Now, if you are kind of driving the car figuratively um, at that moment, you might be the one scribing and writing down the steps if this is at the beginning of our guided practice. So you're showing them, okay, I hear that you will have a book talk in three weeks, but the first step is reading the book. So step number one, read the book. Well, that reading the book itself has a, a bunch of pieces to it because you may have a book with 100 pages and you've only got two weeks to read it. So we have to do a little math. You know, you've got 14 days, 100 page. How many pages do you have to read each night and set it out that way? So it seems like it's micromanaging, but at the beginning, this is the skill that they need. They need to know that you don't just show up three days before the assignments due and 
try and get it all done. So we work backwards, we put dates, uh, we put mini tasks, we try and break things into smaller pieces. And then we look at the, the full schedule and think, okay, well, not only do we have this assignment, but there are a few other assignments as well. So you've got to juggle those mini dates as well to make sure that they fit in with the other priorities, family priorities, all of the other things that we do on a regular basis. But this idea of working backwards has been so helpful for our students. And at first they may balk at it because it seems at first like it makes more work for them. But once you've been through it a few times, the, a student starts to see it's helpful because by the time they get to the end of their time frame, they're not feeling stressed they're not melting down as much and they're actually getting their work done and that boosts confidence and that boosts their self-esteem because they're actually participating in the way that they're supposed to participate. So again, more of the onus is on the parent in the earlier years or at the beginning of the practice, but as the time goes on, we see with our own students and sometimes this takes between grade six and grade seven and grade eight, where we've seen a student who is in grade six and they've got, you know, their bags are exploding. They don't know when something is due. They don't know when something is, uh, you know, a quiz is coming up next, but slowly but surely over time, they start to get a, a stronger handle on what it is that they have to do. And they're actually the ones that come in and put their agenda on the desk and say, okay, so today I have to work on this. And the day that that happens is the day that we do a little happy dance in the background because we know that the work that they put in and the work that we put in is actually paying off. So again, got to just hold on through the, the difficult murky bits until you get to the piece where it's starting to show that sunshine, the light is breaking through. All right, let's see what else I've got on my lovely slides. So a question here. Yes. How do we help the child stay on task? My son drifts off after picking up one thing, typing one word, et cetera, and needs constant reminders to get back on task that it frustrates the both of us. Okay. So I'm going to show you a couple of things a little bit later, some actual visual timers that might help. Um, and if that's the case, and you can only write one or two words at a time, I think at this point, you have to sort of challenge him just a little bit further where he's still feeling that he can, you know, meet the priority or meet the the expectation um, and take a lot of breaks but take body breaks like standing up do five jumping jacks and then sit down and try it again at our office um, and we also encourage for our, our online students to use a bouncy ball those big balls or a, an exercise ball where you can bounce on them because Sometimes movement will keep you focused more. Um, maybe a fidget toy, he needs something just to help his concentration be more streamlined. But it's also um, about setting a reasonable task that he can do in that moment, even if his concentration only lasts for five minutes, what can we get done in five minutes? Okay, once we've got our five minutes done, you're gonna take a two minute break, you're gonna run around the kitchen, you're gonna go and shoot a few basketball hoops, um, whatever he needs to do to get, the, again, get that, uh, the, the oxygen moving and get the endorphins moving and then sit down to do another um, five minutes. It's almost like, uh, what is it called? Circuit training where you move from one thing to the next. So you might lift weights for you know, 30 reps. Oh, that's a lot, I don't know, five reps. Then you move on and you do the stair for, for 10 steps and then you move on to the next thing. But you keep circling back to it so that um, you keep it fresh and you also keep the oxygen moving too. All right, this is just an example of um, planning and prioritizing that backwards planning. And you can see that you've got your presentation due at the end and then it also shows you hours or time frame that you're going to allot to the different pieces. Uh, what else? Okay. I know we're going to feel like we're going to run out of time. Um, organization, this is, you know, just a way of keeping track of loose papers. I would say accordion files can be helpful because they have different slots for different things. I like this idea where you color code like a binder and a small folder. Maybe the binder you keep at home, but the small folder goes to school so that the loose papers can get stuck in there. One of the biggest issues, especially for middle school and high school kids, is that they get papers that don't have holes in them. So a teacher hands out an assignment sheet or hands out uh, something to do, 
It doesn't have any holes. And so they don't know what to do with it and they shove it in their bag. So one investment is a small, thin, um, it's called like a binder size three hole punch that lives in the binder and they can pop their own holes into it and then get it into the, into the binder faster. But for most kids, I think even if they get things stuck, shoved in their bag, the best thing is to do a, a weekly clean out. So on a particular day, the bag gets dumped, everything gets taken onto the table and sorted into its different categories. And they may need help at first, but again, this is something we teach our students over time. And it doesn't usually take too long. Um, a child will understand, oh, okay, my first step is dump it. Second step is put all the science pieces together, all the English pieces together, and then to put them in their right places. So you wanna make sure that they have a decent binder that's big enough to carry everything. Um, and then they can file things or some kind of a standing file folder at home where they've got file folders for each subject and they can put their things in there. Okay, let's moving, moving on. What else have we got? Um, this is a picture of a locker. Some kids may not have lockers right now because of the COVID situation. Um, but I would say, okay, here's a quick story. My husband's, my husband's aunt, uh, was a stickler for keeping things organized. And she, she had executive functioning skills like to the nth degree. And she had a hutch and she uh, would have family dinners, but it would really stress her out that she wasn't able to put back all of the dishes and all of the things that she'd taken out from the hutch in exactly the same spot. So her granddaughter came up with the brilliant idea one day of taking a picture of the optimal organization of that hutch and they kept that picture taped to the inside of the hutch so that the aunt would know where to put exactly everything back every time she took it out and it reduced her stress and it made setting the table and cleaning up a lot easier. So for kids with weaker skills, again, taking a picture of what it's supposed to look like or even drawing drawing out you know, a shape of this is where your calculator is gonna go, this is where your stapler is gonna go, etc. cetera. Um, anything that you can contain basket and, and hooks for things are really important. You'll see some other pictures in a minute. And then again, that supervised clean out of the bag and of the locker, it has to be supervised at first until the student gets in the, the swing of it and is able to do it on their own. Okay, here's a picture of the time management tool that I was talking about. This is the timed timer or the time timer. And you can see that it has um, a red film and when you turn the crank it's just old school you turn the, the crank and the time starts to count down you actually see how much time is left and as that time moves on the red film dis disappears and you see the fraction of time that you have left this timer has been a game changer for so many of our students so if you have a, a child who has difficulty focusing and staying on task, you might set it for 10 minutes and say, okay, we're going to just work for 10 minutes. But by them being able to visually see what 10 minutes actually looks like, it gives them, um, it reduces their stress because a lot of students, ADHD students, kids with weak executive functions, they don't actually understand what time is. So they know that it goes and that somebody gets mad at them for not getting finished at the time that the timer is up, but they don't understand actually how much time that what time means to them so i found this really really helpful with many of our students um, i use it at home you know when my my daughter was younger and we wanted to let's say clean up the playroom in 10 minutes we would actually visually show how much time she had left or for getting out the door in the morning i find it really helpful you know, if we know that we've got a half an hour before we have to leave the house, she can actually see how much time she has left and it becomes much more real for her. Um, again, making sure that you lay out those steps of what's, what is asked, what they're asked for and uh, making a visual reminder, maybe that list at the front door that says what you need to, to leave with. You need your bag, you need your hat, you need your jacket, and then you can be out the door. All right, let's see. Uh, here's another example of a visual a visual schedule or a visual reminder for younger kids or for older kids. Um, just let them know the order of events and how, how they have to get things done before they go. 
Here's some more time management tools. Um, we talk about some apps. Todoist is a great app. It's, um, it's a list making app and it allows you to carry things over from one day to the next. Um, it allows you to check things off, which is very satisfying. And you can you know, cross-reference your lists and keep your lists and, and do all sorts of things. So that's an app that you might wanna check out. Um, in terms of students who miss deadlines because they either don't hear when the thing is due or they don't make a note of it and then it leaves their brain and they, they don't remember by the time they get home, um, always, always, always communicate with the teacher. And I think if you do have a child who has challenges, that's your first stop is to, to have a conversation with your child's teacher to say, these are what my kid is really good at. He's really amazing at these things. These are things he's pretty good at. And these are the challenges. These are the things we're really working on. And if you can be clear about what the challenges are and what he's really good at, you and the teacher hopefully can come together to um, create a system that will work both at school and at home. A Google Calendar or um, another, I think we're going to talk about in a minute, another um, organizational work calendar is called Trello, which has been really, really helpful for our students. All of these things where you can set reminders and you can um, have alarms go off really do help keep our students on track and, and keep them moving forward. Uh, there is an example of a Google Calendar where it looks this to me, you know, for some students it may look overwhelming, but you can hide different the color coding so that you can only see one thing at a time. In this case, we've color coded family events. Um, we've talked about different different aspects of the person's life. You can also color code by um, subject. So you can see all the assignments for the pieces that are due by assignment and then just show one subject at a time. Let's see what else we've got. Um, so here we're talking a little bit about response inhibition and things like blurting out in class, that emotional regulation or the response inhibition. One of the things that we want to do is really talk about it with the student at, at a different time. So often that blurting out in class is just that I have something in my brain, I need to say it really quickly. Um, and we want to train our kids to take, take a moment, take a breath before they say something. You can count backwards from 10. In this case, there's a poster, you know, sometimes a teacher will have a poster on the wall and it's color coded with the, the red, yellow, and the green. So it's sort of green light is when you keep these thoughts in your head. Yellow is when you raise your hand and the red is like emergency, you, you need to tell the teacher right away. But again, it is practice and it's about taking the time to talk to your child about it when they're not in the moment. So if you hear that they're blurting out a lot in class, you wanna to talk to them in a moment where it's not in the middle of class. It's at a quiet moment when you can have an, um, a more personal conversation with that student. All right, emotional control. That's trying to keep your emotions under control. We talk a lot about belly breathing where you put one hand on your chest and one hand on your belly and you can just practice breathing into the belly and letting your hand move forward and then as you exhale you are releasing the breath through your chest as well um, i think again talk to the teacher if your child has a lot of emotional outbursts or difficulty with emotional control you want to have that conversation so that the teacher can have um, a greater understanding of what's behind those emotional outbursts and how to deal with them um, maybe they come up with a, a private signal that you know the child needs to get a breath of fresh air they take a walk around the classroom um, whatever it is that works for that individual so that they can help to keep their calm but again talking about it when they're not in that emotionally heightened state is the best time to do that all right we talk about the emotional control zones or the zones of regulation uh, it, this is a program it's a registered program and it just talks about you know when you're in a different zone what zone do you want to be in? you want to be in the green zone um, but of course what do you do when you're in these other zones and how do you recognize them and then steps that you can take to get yourself back to the green zone can be helpful for adults too sustained attention uh you know that's just sticking with something 
we often recommend the app Stay Focused, which blocks out any other um, Facebook or what they call time wasting websites. So you can you can decide what you want to let in and what you want to keep out for a period of time. Um, there are a few different ones, but basically to keep attention, you want to start with a very small task, small chunk of a task. Use the timer, a visual timer, a microwave timer, or a, a, an online timer. There's some really fun ones, actually. Things like, um, it's another visual timer where it's like a, a, a time bomb, like a, an explosive, and then the wick starts to move itself down as the time is over, and then pff, it explodes when it's over. Sometimes that can be more distracting, but fun also for, for students to watch how time actually works. Um, and only a few directions at a time, like really, really small tasks. And then success and praise and excitement and do a little happy dance and then move on to the next one. All right, so we're getting to the end. Thank you so much for all of your attention. I know I've got so much information. I always put too much information in here. Um, but I, I just have so much to say. How do we put it all together? So target your desired behavior and make a plan with your child. So have that conversation when they are calm, when you are calm, maybe when there are fewer distractions around. Sometimes driving in the car is a good time to have those conversations if it's, you know, if, if you've got their attention in the right way. Engage them in the process. Really, really important that this is not just a parent coming at a child with a whole list of tasks that they must do. This is a collaboration. This is something that you want to sit down and say, hmm, okay, what's working about this situation and what's not working? And have a conversation. What do you think is working? How do you work best? Is it easier for you to work with headphones on when you can do some noise canceling and, and you can't hear the dog barking or your brother or sister running around? Or is it better for you to be in a quiet space, you know, in, in your own room? We can talk about that another time, kids working in their own room. It's not always the best, but you have to honor where they're coming from and try and negotiate from that place. Um, completing the routine together multiple times before expecting the child to take it on for themselves. And multiple times might be three or four. It might be 30 or 40. It really depends on the task and it depends on the, the child. Um, making accommodations if necessary. So you may find that what you thought was going to work, it's not working. So take a step back. Let's regroup, figure out what's going to make it easier or better. Remember that the idea is success. We want our students and our kids to feel success. We want them to feel good about the work that they're doing. So we want to set it up so that they can feel that success, even if it's just that first step of success, and then we move on to the next task. Giving your child time and space to achieve independence, that's that gradual release of responsibility. And I would say visual cues as often as possible. Don't rely on just the talking to get them to understand how to do something. We really have to look at um, what it looks like and then get that into the mind before they can move forward. We know that all of these skills are really important. We know that uh, you know, your future depends on it to some degree, holding down a job and being able to juggle priorities. But it is a process and even adults who have weak executive function you know, they are still successful in many, many realms. In certain areas, maybe they're not so successful. I have a friend who is a vice principal at an inner city school in Toronto, an incredible, wonderful human being, amazing educator, loses her keys almost weekly. In fact, she has like a stash of keys so that she doesn't, you know, she knows she's going to lose them here and there, here and there, but she knows that she's always got extras hidden somewhere. So are you know is that her strength keeping track of her her keys and her gloves and you know those little things no is she an incredible educator and takes care of the entire school yes so we have to balance those pieces as well um all right i want to tell you very quickly about what we do 
in terms of supporting executive functioning skills. So as I've alluded to, we do one-on-one um, -on -one support where we work with students. Right now we're working exclusively online, which makes it terrific for kids who are not in the Toronto area. Um, all of our teachers are certified teachers and are highly, highly dedicated to working with kids with learning challenges. They are experts in that realm. And we have a whole host of tools and strategies that we haven't even had a chance to mention here that we use on a very regular basis. So that's our one-on-one -on -one support. We also have group classes for organization, time management, um, uh, the executive functioning skills as a whole, and we keep our group classes very small. We also do test preparation. So if your kids are moving on to um, pri private schools, they need to do an entrance test. We work with students in that way as well. And I just want to show you what's coming up for us that's related to the executive functions. So we have our Power Planners Junior, which is a maximum of 10 students per class. It's an online class, but because it's 10 students and it's live, they're gonna get a lot of interaction. And a lot of these tools that we've talked about are part of that class. So taking the students through some of the most essential uh, aspects of planning and prioritizing and organizing and time management. So we have a junior, which is grades six to eight. We have a senior, which is grades nine to 12. And then we have our class called on it, like I'm on it, which is four students maximum. And this is for kids who want a little more accountability and they're going to have uh, more personalized assistive technology and um, executive functioning training. Again, there are only four kids in that class. So you're going to get a lot of one-on-one -on -one attention. And if you have any questions at all, I, I'm, I've got lots of time. I encourage you to stay on the call and put your, your questions in the chat and we can continue the conversation. Um, again, we are going to send out a, an email at the end of this presentation. I would love your feedback. If uh, constructive feedback is always welcome and we try and change things for each group of um, for each group of listeners. So, you know, your feedback is really important to me. I take it very seriously. And I would love to be in touch with any of you who would like to be in touch with us. You can contact us at ruthrumack.com. Uh, we're also on Twitter and Facebook, and uh, I'll put the handle on that later. Um, and I just really want to thank concentrating and for being there for your kids. I think that that is really, you got to give yourselves a pat on the back for that one. Have to navigate now, especially whether you're doing at home schooling or part, part at home, part in school, we're trying to communicate with the teachers, but you know what, by showing up here and learning something new, hopefully you, you've taken something new with you from tonight, um, you're doing the right thing and you're doing a great job. So I, my hat goes off to you and I wish you all a wonderful evening. And if you want to stick around, I'm open for questions. Thanks everybody. Any questions, put them in the chat and Joelle will, will shout them out. There is one question. Comments, if you, you know, have some. Yeah, sorry. Uh, I've tried to stand timer before and that gave him anxiety seeing that he is losing time. Is there another solution? Oh, how about a, a song? Um, now it depends if you're, you're using the timer to get a task done like cleaning up or getting ready for school is to create a family playlist or a task playlist. So this is not for getting schoolwork done, but this is for getting um, something done, like, like cleaning the kitchen. You have a set number of songs that, that you like, you choose the songs together, and then you know that, you know, at the end of this song, we should be this far along in our cleaning, or we're only going to clean until the, the second song is over, so that there's something to look forward to and there's something to distract as well. If the timer aspect that he's losing time and he's getting more and more anxious about losing time don't do it it's it's just going to add to the frustration and it's going to add to the anxiety so what is an alternative for that i think the alternative for that might be chunking and looking at the task itself so instead of saying how many questions how many math questions can you complete 
before the timer runs out. For a lot of kids that is anxiety producing because they start to get anxious about time and they lose focus on the actual task. Um, let's just say, and make it reasonable to start with. Let's try and do three questions first. Let's just try and get through three questions. When we get through three questions, we're gonna take a break. And if he does that, reasonably quickly, calmly. Okay, this time let's do four questions. And we're gonna try and slowly, gradually increase the, the amount of work. If the timer doesn't work, then you have to go by, um, by quantity so that there is still something that you're doing that is, has a natural beginning and a natural end. Because a lot of kids get really anxious about, when is this gonna be over? When am I going to be released from this? So if, you, if they know that when we complete this, they're gonna get a break, sometimes it relieves the, the, um, the anxiety. I hope that's helpful. Any other questions? Someone asked, is there an overlap between your EF programs that you just described and your writing programs like Power Paragraphs? Ooh, good question. Okay, we didn't even talk about the Power Paragraphs. Silly me. Um, power Paragraphs is a very structured approach to writing a paragraph. And it is very... Um, step by step, very scaffolded, which is a educational buzzword, but it's step by step um, with very clear instructions, very explicit instructions on how to build a strong paragraph. So that has executive function ideas built in, which is, you know, practicing prioritizing, figuring out, you know, what the plan is going to be, but it's not the same as the power planners, which would be really looking at executive functioning skills, like the planning and prioritizing of school work, where in the power, the, um, the writing program, it's more about the prioritizing of your ideas within learning how to write a paragraph. So, there are underlying skills that are the same, but it, you could take both of them and you wouldn't be crossing over. You wouldn't be learning the same thing in power planners as in power paragraphs. So they don't cross over in that way, although the underlying skills may be similar. What else have you got for me? Someone is asking, are there plans for EF programming for grades four to six? And also at what grade does agenda use become fairly mainstream in public school? Ooh, good question. Okay, I'll do the agendas first. Uh, agendas are, are school dependent and some, I, I have to shake my head, but some schools don't even use a paper agenda anymore, if you can believe it, because they've crossed over to only using a learning portal. So, in the case where your child is not using an agenda, I would say grade four is probably a good time. If they haven't been introduced to an agenda before, grade four is a good time to do it. Um, I would actually create an agenda for a grade one student. It's a simple agenda, but it still, you know, talks about that idea of, well, what do we have today? I mean, a simple agenda is really a calendar. So you could look at a month long calendar for earlier years, like grade one and two, up to grade three maybe, but grade four is really when you wanna start looking at different subjects and being able to map out what a child has to do. Because grade four, you're now in, you're not primary anymore, you're a junior student and the expectations definitely um, increase. So as soon as those, in, those expectations increase, the workload increases and you have to take care of and take, keep track of more things. So grade four is a good time to start it. Um, would we go lower than grade six to eight? Yes, we probably would if there's enough, um, if there's enough call for it. I think some, you know, depending on what the level of expectation of the school is, some students don't actually have a lot of homework or things to do at home um, before grade six. And some classrooms prefer that all the work for a project are actually done in class so that the teachers can be the ones monitoring that bigger piece of it. And they're trying to teach that kind of prioritization and they want to see the level of work that the student is doing independently as opposed to at home. So back to the first part, would we do something for grade four and five? Yes, we would. If we had enough interest, we certainly would. Um, and 
using an agenda starting in grade four. What else? Someone just wants to hear more information on power paragraphs. Oh, power paragraphs. I love power paragraphs. Okay, so power paragraphs is um, a process of learning to write a paragraph from the very beginning. And what we've done is we've taken the traditional idea of the hamburger paragraph, right? I'm sure you're familiar, usually starting in grade four, they start talking about the hamburger paragraph where you have your bun, that's your introduction, you have your meat or your meat alternative, and that's all of the information. And then you have your bottom bun, which is your, your conclusion. I take that hamburger bun and I squish it and I throw it out the window because I, I've never felt that it was enough information, that it was explicit enough to teach a student how to create a paragraph. So we went numerical and we did something uh, called the power paragraph or, or, or power writing, which starts with your power one. We give every part of the paragraph a number. And this works really well for kids who may have a strength in, you know, numbers and, and math side of things, but not such a strength on the verbal side of things. So instead of having to remember the words conclusion, supporting detail, transition word, um, you know, introduction, etc. We've given them each, each section has a number. Your power one is simple. It's just your what. What are you talking about? So we start by just brainstorming a whole bunch of what's uh, on a particular topic. Then when we know what our what is, that's our power one, we start brainstorming power twos. And power twos just talk about the power one. So let's say our power one is chocolate. We might brainstorm and we use lots of visual organizers or graphic organizers or mind maps is another way of, of calling it. So again, we're teaching the students not just to think about these things in their head, but to get their ideas on paper. And we use some assistive technology for that too, some mind mapping technology. Um, so your power one is chocolate. Your power twos might be the fact that chocolate is delicious, that chocolate gives us energy, that chocolate um, is a great afternoon snack. So we brainstormed a whole bunch of things about chocolate, and then we're going to go back and prioritize them. What do we want to talk about first? What do we want to talk about second and third? And from there, we learn about, um, what else do we learn about? Oh, we'll, we'll do a a power one sentence starter. So most kids have difficulty starting their paragraph. They have fabulous ideas. They've got lots to talk about when they're talking out loud orally, but when they go to write things down, it's confused. They haven't fleshed out the ideas. They aren't using details. They aren't using strong sentences or strong words. So we give them a, a sentence starter and we actually teach six different ways to start any paragraph. And they learn those six different ways over time and they practice with them. And we do use lots of visual organizers again. Um, and then they, they have a great starting point. So now they know, okay, I know what I'm talking about. I know what I want to use to support that idea. And I actually have a way of starting my paragraph. I'm off to the races. But we also want to practice organizing the information, talking about transition words, or we call them signal words that you're moving from one point to the next. It's a whole program. And it's a program that is over a number of sessions. Um, usually it's a 10 session program. And that power paragraphs will give them the real foundation for being able to apply those ideas to any type of paragraph, whether it is um, an expository paragraph, moving into you know, an opinion paragraph or a persuasive paragraph, even going into something like a descriptive paragraph. So you start with learning how to use the paragraph. And then from there, you would move on to learning how to do a full essay, an opinion essay. Then you move on to a literary essay. And we have different levels for different age groups and different needs. But at that beginning, the foundation is really the power paragraphs, which is understanding all the different parts of the paragraph, 
why they're important, and what sequence you, you use. So again, it's a process. You follow the process. And when you follow the process and you trust the process, you end up with a fabulous paragraph. More questions. Okay, so this one is uh, multiple questions within one. So the first one is, do you have, uh, this is about power paragraphs, do you have strategies for kids enrolling who might be reluctant to learn? Oh, for sure. I forgot to mention, this is the biggest part. What we've done is we have taken every one of those aspects and we've turned it into an activity. So in fact, they do an activity or a game first that they don't even know relates to the idea or the process of writing or the writing process. So we do an activity in a game first um, that catches their attention. And then we use that activity and game or what they've learned from it to apply that knowledge to the, the process of writing that paragraph. So for reluctant learners, it's fabulous because it catches their attention. It's active. It's multi-sensory, which means that it's not just sitting there listening or writing things, taking notes. It's about being engaged and being part of the process itself. Um, and you're learning as you go. So, you know, for so many of our reluctant learners, this has been a real game changer because they've been able to, um, hone in on what it is that they need to know, and then they go back to class. And even though the classroom may not be using the power paragraph structure, they have it with them. We send you, you know, out with your whole list of sentence starters and a whole page of transition words and, uh, you know, wonderful wrap up. We call them power one um, conclusions because your conclusion actually has to match with what you started. So. It's, an, it's about that cycle of what you started with, you have to end with. So they have all kinds of tools that they can use. And a, a student actually who is now, I think in university by now, said to me very recently, and, and we started working with him off, off and on probably when he was in grade four. He said to me, you know, I still have my signal words up on my bulletin board. And when I write my university essays, I refer back to that signal word list to help me transition from paragraph to paragraph. So they're skills that they're going to take with them forever. And they are fun and engaging. And it's, it's, a, it's, it's just a hoot. Like it's, it's a fun time. And they don't even realize that they're learning skills that are going to be applicable for the rest of their lives. And the other part of the question, if the school grade four is not practicing a lot of paragraph writing in this moment, would it be out of place to do power paragraphs as the child won't be continuing to practice this in class or should we wait until more writing is required at school? No, do it now. Do it now because the writing process, like any process, takes time to develop. And even though a child may go through the power paragraph lessons, um, they're not, you know, we, we can't guarantee that a child is going to, you know, in that time frame, get all of the information that they need. So it's a process, you wanna practice it and you wanna practice it over and over again and apply the same skills in different situations. So I would say that now is the best time to do it, whether they're doing a lot of writing or not, because the earlier you start to be clear about the, what that process is and what the structure of a paragraph is, the easier it will be to apply when the school gets around to doing it. And, and again, like I said, my fear is that if you go old school with the hamburger paragraph, it's not very clear, okay, you know you need an, an introduction, but how do you get there? How do you write, like, what is the introductory sentence? Where does it come from? How do you develop it? And that child is going to have a whole set of skills in their back pocket that they can apply to whatever their classroom teacher is going to use. So don't wait. Okay. Uh, oh, somebody wants to know if the power writing classes build on each other. So like power opinion, essay, and so on. They do. They do. But you don't have to have taken the early ones. It's not a, a prerequisite. You, you can take the, let's say, the opinion essay without taking the power writing. <clears throat> However, you couldn't, you wouldn't want to take that essay writing course if the student didn't have a strong idea of what a paragraph was. Um, so you don't, just because, you know, they're sort of grade appropriate, you don't want to parachute a student into the essay writing or the opinion essay if they don't have a strong understanding of how to create a paragraph. 
So they do build one to the other. We've created our, our, our suite of classes based on um, the whole big picture. But at the same time, you can, if you have the prerequisite skills, you can join us at any time. That's it for the questions. Okay. Wonderful. Well, I'll, I'll just, I'll be like, any more questions? Give you another half a moment. No. All right. Well, anybody who's left on the call, thank you so much for sticking around. Um, and if you do want to get in touch with us, please, by all means, don't hesitate. We have a wonderful uh, client services team. There's all of our handles. Just check us out at ruthrumac.com. And we will be happy to answer any questions that you have. And I really thank you for your time. And I appreciate it. And I hope to see you on our next call. Take care. Good night.